Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, what's making news today? Wall to wall coverage in Berlin as the global media marked the anniversary of the end of the Cold War. But was it a new dawn for the media in Eastern Europe? North Korea, Kim Jong il says no to advertising on state run television. The Arabic talent show that says it's in tune with Islam. And those Filipino jailbirds are at it again. This time, they want to break free. The day the Berlin Wall came down 20 years ago marked a political turning point, the end of the Soviet Empire's dominance over parts of Eastern and Central Europe. The global media went into anniversary overdrive this past week, flocking to the German capital. Back on November 9th, 1989, the media discourse was dominated by talk of new freedoms, including freedom of speech and freedom of the press. But has all that promising talk been realized? The short answer is yes, no, and not quite. On this edition of The Listening Post, we're taking a look at the state of media in the new democracies that once made up the Soviet bloc. Our starting point this week is Berlin and the media landscape in Europe two decades after the fall of the wall. A historic moment tonight. The Berlin Wall can no longer contain the East German people. Astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. The wall it was history unfolding on the air. The streets of East Berlin have been thrown... One of those big media moments, the kind that decades later would have people asking, where were you when the wall came down? The people are here to celebrate freedom. For the people that just want to be a part of this event at the Brandenburg Gate and mark the 20th anniversary. The Iron Curtain, which split the world into East and West, ceased to exist. Among the channels covering the anniversary was Russia's English-language news network, Russia Today. There was also media from former Soviet bloc countries. But how free have they been to report this or any other story? There are many prevailing factors that threaten press freedom in Central Eastern Europe. There still is political interference, political control. There are problems with libel laws, high taxes, police interference, problems with protection of sources. There have even been journalists murdered in, in Croatia, in Bulgaria. The Media Watch Group, Reporters Without Borders, publishes an annual press freedom index. The highest ranking former Soviet state, 24th in press freedom, Freedom, is the Czech Republic, just ahead of Hungary. Then come Poland and Slovenia, tied at 37, and Bosnia and Herzegovina at 39. It is worth noting that those four countries all ranked ahead of established European Union countries, France and Italy. Romania is at 50, but the rest of the post-wall media picture is not so pretty. Bulgaria at 68, Georgia at 81. Belarus at 151, and the center of the old Soviet empire, Russia, is 153rd of the 175 countries listed. What politicians in many of these places have learned uh, over these 20 years was the fact that uh, the media, as during communism in fact, uh, is a great tool uh, to pursue your own um, interests, either a personal interests, business interests, political interests. Russia did enjoy a brief window of relative media freedom during the Yeltsin years in the mid-1990s before Vladimir Putin rolled back the clock. Belarus under President Alexander Lukashenko is and has consistently been in a category of its own. One has to say Belarus um, is a very special case. There's still about 95% of the media is in, in government hands. The government does not even pretend to respect press freedoms. In January of this year, we reported on Romania, on the story of Rodica Kulcher, the head of news at the country's state-funded TVR, who was pulled off the air for reporting that a politician was taking bribes. That's just one of many media stories in Romania. This year, in February, the Constitutional Court in Romania uh, ruled that uh, defamation should be should become again uh, a criminal offense. So we see again this type of uh, retrogressive trend. The public television and radio, those are not independent media and every new government that Romanians uh, have had uh, since 1989 has failed in passing legislation that grants public broadcasters uh, independence. 
uh, when speaking about the commercial uh, television, uh, it is more and more perceived like a means of gaining political and economical clout. That was the case in Georgia in 2007. In Mady TV, a station owned by a wealthy businessman and presidential candidate was shut down by the government in the middle of a news broadcast. There's a pattern of intimidating the media in the former Soviet bloc. Sometimes, such as in Slovakia, intimidation comes in the form of legislation. They amended the press law in 2008, and actually what they were trying to do was to paralyze media through a system of obliging the media to give right of reply to anybody uh, in the country. And uh, the media feared that such a, uh, uh, such a legal provision would actually offer politicians the right to, to flood the media with, with replies every day. Slovakia and Romania both made it into the European Union. Among the criteria for membership was a free and fair media. That criterion was met for a while. Once many of these countries became part of the European Union, there was no mechanism to ensure that they continue to comply with the uh, principles such as independence for the media, media freedom, and so on. And since then, actually, the state of the media has worsened in many of these places. However, to be fair to the new EU states, long-time EU members like Italy and France have, according to the Press Freedom Index, also slipped back. So when critics in Western Europe look down on the media in the East, they're applying a double standard. In Italy, Silvio Berlusconi, who was at the same time Prime Minister and still owns most of um, private media, but also controls very much the public service broadcasting. France is slightly different. There, the media has been taken over by big business. Very often, big business has had also some relations with the, the Prime Minister. So we are concerned also in France, but I have to say more still in Italy about the situation. For 20 years of post-Cold War history, the prevailing attitude in the West has been that Soviet bloc countries have much to learn about freedom of the press. But there's another way to look at it that in some ways media audiences in the former East Bloc are more sophisticated than those in the West. They were used to being fed information that was obviously incorrect. They learned to read that as untrue. And so they continue to, to distrust media now in, in a similar way, just generally being a bit more skeptical of what comes out of the media. What's making news today? Hello. And that skepticism of what is reported in the media is something audiences on the other side of the old wall, audiences in the West, could benefit from. Here's how our Global Village voices see European media 20 years after the fall of the wall. While I can understand that some people in Eastern Europe would be a bit sensitive about West Europeans criticizing them on media issues, the fact that there are undoubtedly problems in countries like Britain and Italy with freedom of the press doesn't mean that it's somehow okay for free debate to be stifled in Eastern Europe. And actually, I think that people in Eastern Europe who can remember what it was like having a captive media during communism probably do know that better than anybody else. We should remember that the events in Berlin 20 years ago only reached so far, and there are still millions of people who have to live under repressive regimes in the extended Europe, uh, especially in the former Soviet Union. The situation for journalists is very serious. Being part of the European Union isn't in itself a guarantee for a free media, as we've seen in Italy recently, but there is a living debate in Europe which hasn't been allowed to develop. If you'd like to be one of our Global Village voices, there are multiple ways to let us know. You can go on Facebook and look for the Listening Post page. More than 2,500 viewers have already signed up there. You can also follow us through Twitter. Or you can email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. We will let you know via Facebook and Twitter what stories we're working on and how you can add your voice to the mix. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The world's biggest media baron, Rupert Murdoch, the owner of News Corp, says he remains determined to charge for online content, but that news surfers won't be digging into their pockets for a while yet. Murdoch's plan was to start charging online readers by June of next year. That self-imposed deadline has now been moved back, although Murdoch won't say how far. Here's how he sees News Corp's relationship with online readers. Well, they shouldn't have had it free all the time. <clears throat> I think we've been asleep. 
Rupert Murdoch has a big problem with Google, which he says is making money by aggregating news content while the people who create the content get almost nothing apart from some advertising revenues from their own sites. Iran's Arabic language satellite television channel Al Alam has been knocked off the air by two Arab controlled satellite companies. The operators of the Egyptian satellite firm Nilesat and the Saudi Arabian company Arabsat both say they discovered a breach of contract. That's according to Egypt's MENA news agency, although no one is saying just what that breach actually was. It's a tense time in relations between Shia Iran and Western allied Sunni states such as Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And analysts have said Arab governments are worried that the channel's popularity among Arab viewers contributes to Iran's growing regional influence. A statement by Hezbollah, which is aligned with Iran, condemns the decision by Arabsat and Nilesat, saying it was made on political grounds and calling it a violation of freedom of the press. Back in September, we reported on Sultan Munadi, the Afghan journalist killed when British commandos tried to free him and his colleague, the New York Times reporter Stephen Farrell, from kidnappers. Farrell was freed while Munadi's lifeless body was left behind. Now, the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists wants Britain to investigate just what happened during that raid and whether Munadi was in fact killed by British bullets. The CPJ has sent a letter to Prime Minister Gordon Brown raising other unanswered questions. Afghan journalists have also accused the commandos of failing to make Munadi's safe release an operational priority. Munadi's family was outraged by what happened, saying that it was negotiating with the hostage takers and was confident that the two men would have been released anyway. One of Cuba's most renowned bloggers has said that she was abducted, beaten and threatened by government agents in Havana. Ioani Sanchez made the accusations on her blog. She said that she was detained along with another blogger on the way, ironically, to a demonstration against violence. Sanchez says that while being bundled into the car by security personnel, she was called a counter-revolutionary. Sanchez blogged that the ordeal left her covered in bruises and fearing for her life, but she remains defiant in her writings, ending her blog on the incident by saying that her assailants know that their days are numbered. Sanchez blogs through the site DesteCuba.com. A beer commercial has reportedly cost one of North Korea's top TV officials his job. When the commercial first aired on state-run television back in July, news agencies outside North Korea were quick to report on it, suggesting that the ad, as well as adverts for hairpins, ginseng and quail meat, were all signs that some commercial changes had come to the country. But now comes word via South Korean state-funded news agency Yonhap that not only have the ads been taken off the air, the official who okayed them has been fired. Yonhap reports that North Korean leader Kim Jong-il was infuriated by the new commercial direction the channel was taking, although Kim himself had issued instructions that programming should be more interesting and diverse. We're back after the break with a report on the Arabic talent show that takes its cues from Islam. Welcome back. The Arab television market has exploded in both size and choice since the 1990s. There are now more than 450 free-to-air Arabic language channels, and more than 40 of them are devoted almost exclusively to music. The first generation of those channels was dominated by music videos produced in the West, featuring pop stars who had nothing to do with the Arab world. These days, Arabic music channels broadcast more and more videos produced in places like Beirut, Cairo and Dubai, but many of the videos have a look and a feel that's definitely non-Arab. Now there's a new kid on the music television block looking to overturn the American influence on Arab airwaves. The listening posts Salah Qadar now on a music television venture that's both clever and controversial in that it infuses Arab pop videos with Islamic values. The singing contestant, the row of judges, the phone in voting numbers. It doesn't be. It could be just another Arab version of American Idol or The X Factor. But listen harder and look a little closer, and you'll find that this isn't just a rip off of the talent competition format. This is Sultak Wasil, Arabic for Your Voice is Heard dubbed by the world's media, Islamic Idol, for its promotion of Islamic values. 
if you look across the world, reality TV, particularly those which actually show any kind of musical talent, with the auditions, with the performance, it, it's a fantastic format. There is simply a way to discover new talents. In every field, you have to have some kind of strategy to discover new talents so that you can feed this field. Even in the Arab world, if you look at Superstar, which is the local version of Pop Idol, if you look at Star Academy, They've all been big hits because people like to see any unknown from the Arab world suddenly become a star. And here you have the phenomenon of actually trying to do it through an Islamic guy. And it's this Islamic guy that's crucial to both the show, Saltaq Wasil, and the channel which broadcasts it. The satellite station called For Shabab, or For the Youth, is the brainchild of Egyptian media entrepreneur Ahmed Abu Heba. But this is an Arabic music channel with a difference. The channel is really unique. We use the tools of the liberal channels to deliver the message of the conservative channels. The youth that have grown up with MTV, all of the pop culture icons that uh, they're familiar with from the West, started to feel that this type of media does not represent them 100%. On the other hand, you have the traditional media, which they still can identify with to a certain degree, but it still does not speak for them. And now they are speaking up and saying, we want more. We want media that speaks for us. We want popular culture that is our own. Until now, Arab audiences have become accustomed to Arab music videos that bear a strong resemblance to America's MTV. But it's through Four Shabab's own on-message music videos and contests that the network hopes it will convert viewers to a less westernized form of music television. The kind of beauty of these shows is, you know, one person, rather than the show itself or the actual channel, could be able to transcend that and actually connect with audiences of different ages. I think the philosophy is really uh, trying to find talent, trying to showcase talent in a, a channel and a medium that you would not feel uh, uh, conflicts with your values and, and what you believe in. They may not get that 100% right um, from the get-go, but you know it certainly is an attempt to do that. Seeking to provide its audience with a mix of cultural familiarity and pop appeal, the network that is keen to listen to the tune of Islam is getting flack from all sides. While some conservative voices have shunned for Shabab's modern approach, some liberals have criticized the absence of women from the broadcasts. Can we really celebrate or praise a show which still has that kind of distinction between men and women? Is that really what we want to be saying? Is that the message that we want to be getting out there to the young of the Arab world and, and, and Muslim worlds? I don't think this is fair. Yeah, we can later, later on, we can make a special program for, for women, but I don't think that we can take women and men together. And of course, I know that our society is not ready yet to accept that, especially as a conservative society, and I'm not going to lose this society. That show does not represent half of society, the, the female demographic. The show itself will evolve in that direction, or another show will come along that uh, does accept both male and female contestants. Uh, and this will, be, uh, this will be a factor contributing to uh, widening the appeal of that show. I am not afraid to stand alone. And for bands like Native Dean, an American Muslim hip-hop outfit, and one of the first bands to be promoted by the channel, it's the ideal place to showcase their talent. But is it too niche? I certainly think that any type of media, however conservative or secular it may be, will find its uh, its niche viewers. Uh, however, the question here is, what are we trying to create? Are we trying to create walled gardens where there's a tiny group of people who consume this media uh, and contribute to it? Or are we really trying to really send positive messages to the world and to the Muslim community at large and reach mainstream appeal? You do have this kind of tension between that modernity and that traditionalism. Can you necessarily um, bypass that simply by putting a kind of Muslim veneer on what is still a very kind of secular idea. If they try and kind of tone down their message too much, they end up like every other show. If they actually stay entirely committed to this kind of core niche uh, message, then they'll never cross over. But in the cutthroat business of TV ratings in the Arab world, 
audiences will decide quickly if Four Shabab's take on what is hip, youthful and Islamic really represents them. More Global Village voices now on music television in the Middle East. Famous programs like Islamic Idol managed to speak with youth with the new modern speeches. This made it easy to reduce the gap between both liberal and conservative circles. I'm not uh, too comfortable with the way uh, the method of teaching Islamic values and principles through this show as it is a show that is geared towards assessing and rating the individual on their singing and musical ab abilities. Similar to Pop Idol, Islamic Idol appeals to a mass audience. I think that the younger generation of Muslims in the Middle East will be very interested. I think that the older generation of Muslims and the more conservative Muslims won't appreciate the way Islam has been associated with idolism, celebrities and music. But in saying that music is a very good way to get the message across and to keep people interested in what you've got to say. Finally, back in 2007, we aired a web video showing a bunch of Filipino jailbirds in their exercise yard doing their dance version of Thriller by the late Michael Jackson. It got a lot of attention, but it wasn't quite the breakout hit they had hoped for. Most of them are still in there. Well, they're back at it now, honing their message. This time, they've chosen to perform a medley of songs by Queen. One of the tracks is, I Want to Break Free. And if this doesn't work, they can always try Aretha Franklin's Rescue Me. We're leaving you, as always, with our web video of the week. And we'll see you next time at the listening post. We will, we will.